thank you so much for giving us time to answer our questions. I must confess uh, that I'm kind of uh, overwhelmed uh, to meet you even through a camera high. Uh, you've been truly a musical companion uh, for me for 50 years. Wow, uh, that's quite some time. <laughs> some time for me too. <laughs> Uh, the Strobs I've been created in 64, 1964, and uh, after a short hiatus uh, at the beginning of the... Uh, that, yes. I'll have to correct you there. I'll yeah, have you, to correct you, you there. I, it, it, we weren't the Strobs in 1964. We were the Strawberry Hill Boys. Uh, we, were the, we started out as a bluegrass group. We were Britain's first bluegrass band with me playing banjo, Tony Hooper on acoustic guitar and, and string bass. And we were known as the Strawberry Hill Boys because I was listening to bands like the Rocky Mountain Boys, the Foggy Mountain Boys, the Stony Mountain Boys, all American, all American bands. And I loved the sound of the banjo and all of that sort of thing. So I decided to learn to play banjo like Earl Scruggs. And I'd, the way I did it was actually to buy an album with Lester Flatt and Earl Scruggs on it slow the record down to half speed so that I could hear the patterns that he was playing with his hat, right hand. And I learned to play the banjo like that from listening to records. And we started out as the Strawberry Hill Boys because uh, we didn't have a name. And somebody came and said, we'd like you to play at our folk club. And we said, uh, they said, what should we advertise you as? And I said, well, wow. we listened to the, we like the Foggy Mountain Boys and the Stony Mountain Boys. And we rehearse in Strawberry Hill, so we'll be the Strawberry Hill Boys. So that's how we started out. The Straws came a bit later when the album came out, the first album. Uh, but you, still, uh, you are very active, actually. Uh, nine albums since the beginning of the 21st century. Uh, what are the tools for such longevity? Is there some kind of secret we should know? Uh, the secret of the longevity of the Straubs I put down to the lyrics of the song. Uh, I think people all over the world identify with the, the, the lyrics of those songs. Whether they understand them exactly as I understood them when I wrote some of those words is not necessarily the same, but it doesn't matter. They identify with them. When we go to America now and to Canada, we have many people who come up to us after a show, couples who come up and say, do you know we got married to one of your songs? And I say, which one was that? And they say, it's the winter long, the end of Hero and Heroine. And they say, we had our first dance to it, or we walked down the aisle to it. And I feel very flattered that people have identified with that song so much that they've chosen it as their wedding song. And it means an awful lot to me. And that song means an awful lot to them. And I'm very proud of the fact that we've, we've managed to influence people that much uh, to want to, want to, as I say, celebrate perhaps the most important day of their lives with one of our songs. And, and you got a very uh, nice body of, of work as far as recording is concerned, but you, you, the Strobs have been very active on the, uh, uh, on the uh, live scene too. Uh, would it be acoustic or electric formation? Uh, do you have just the slightest idea of how many times you went on stage? But uh, have you ever <laughs> stopped to consider that? <laughs> uh, what I have done now, uh, along with the guy who runs our website, Strobes Web, uh, his, na his name is Dick Greener, uh, we have compiled a list of every show that the Strawberry Hill Boys and the Straubs have ever done in the whole of our career. And that's now up. It's just come up on the Straubs website now. So if you wanted to know what we were doing in 1972 in August, you'll find out exactly what we were doing at that month, in that month and that year, where we wow. played. And it's also linked to the recording of the albums so that people can see how the timeline fitted in with it all. Do you? Uh, I, I saw you in 2018, what was supposed to be the farewell tour uh, in Montreal. But I, all, I just read that you, at the beginning of 2020, uh, you did some uh, shows uh, in South Africa 
where you met uh, Chuck uh, Joubert, uh, who's guest basement on the new album Settlement. Uh, can you tell us about that meeting and why you went to place <laughs> so far, so, if I may say? It, it was very strange. Is that the, my lady friend, who I, I'm living with right now, her son lives in South Africa and she wanted to visit him in January last year. And I said, well, I'll come along with you, but I've got to see if I can get some shows over there uh, to, to, to pay for the airfare because it's very expensive. And so I phoned up a, a DJ. I've been in uh, a guy who runs a radio show in South Africa called Shiloh Noon. And his, his radio show is called The Magic Bus. I emailed him and said, if I want to come over, uh, can you, is there any chance you might be able to get some shows for me? And within a week, he'd come back with four shows. And he also came back and said that Skolk Joubert wanted to play with me. Um, he's South Africa's finest bass player. And I went to Port Elizabeth. We, we stayed in Port Elizabeth. And where I went up to Hermanus, where the first show was. I met with Skolk Joubert. And within one hour, we'd rehearsed the whole show. He, I'd sent him the songs in advance. He'd heard them all on YouTube where I told him to listen to them. And within one, about one and a half hours, we'd learnt the whole show. And for the next three nights, we played together. And they were some of the most magical nights I've ever had in my life. I didn't know with any... We'd never played in South Africa, although we did sell lots of records there in the 1970s. But because of apartheid, we couldn't go there. But uh, I didn't know whether anybody would come out to see us, see me play at all. And I played to nearly 800 people over that, over those four days. One show uh, where I had the last show, I had 400 people in an outdoor, outdoor auditorium. And it was absolutely wonderful. In an interview you gave to a colleague of mine two years ago, uh, you talk about the... Uh, uh, the, the quality of the Canadian uh, audiences and the fact that we were among the most receptive. Uh, and I do remember uh, in December 76 at O National Theatre uh, on St. Catherine Street, uh, you gave us, the Strobs gave us four real encores. Uh, actually, uh, the place was full and you got us you, you, you got us crazy with the with the quality of the show. Uh, do you have some souvenir of that particular night? Because that's that's really incorporated in my mind. I never I never forget it. I, I didn't didn't realize we did that many encores, but but it was a magical night, and it's always been magical for us playing in Canada. We sell more records per head of population in Canada than in any other country in the world. We had our biggest ever show in Canada when we played at Maple Leaf Gardens and we drew seven and a half thousand people just to see the Straubs. And it was an astonishing night. Uh, we, now we go back and we play in Toronto in a small club called Hughes Room and it holds 200 people. And we've been going back there now since I think it was 2006. And we played there 37 times now <laughs> in, in, these, in these years. And we played there more than any Canadian artist has ever played in that club. <laughs> and when we go there, we now do two nights. The first time we went, we did three sold out nights and they could not believe that we were selling tickets like it. And every time we go back, it's exactly the same. We've got an open invitation to go back to the theatre in Oakville uh, to play there and at any time. And in Montreal, uh, rather in Quebec, the guy who ran the theatre there said, you can come back any time you want, please come back. It's absolutely magical. Yeah, uh, uh, indeed, in the 70s with uh, Aero and Orion, Ghosts and Nomadness, you had quite a bit of airplay on commercial radios uh, in Canada. Uh, that success, I think, was also a little bit uh, over the States too, am I mistaken? Oh, yes, we, we were popular in America as well. I remember Shom FM and Chum FM and going into the, those radio stations and sitting there and telling them my favorite songs. And they couldn't believe that I was 
into some of the people that I listened to, such as John Mellencamp. They expected me to play folk songs. And I said, no, I, I like John Mellencamp. But anyway, that's immaterial. But uh, we, it was a very curious thing that happened, is that we became very big in the UK in 1973, when we had part of the union. Uh, it went On one chart, it went to number one, and the other chart, it went to number two. The album went to number two, in the charts, and we were huge. We did a 49 uh, theatre tour of the UK, and every night sold out. But then we went over to America, and the band split in two. Uh, Dave Lambert stayed with me, and the other three went away. They formed Hudson Ford, and Blue Weaver went off and joined the Bee Gees band. And Dave Lambert and I put a new band together with Chas Cronk, John Hawkin, and Rod Coombs, and we made Hero and Heroin. And that album took off hugely in America and in Canada. And I was told that in Toronto, if you walk down any college uh, dorm, you know, in, in the halls of residence, I don't know what you call them, in the lodgings and the accommodation sector, every, virtually every room had Hero and Heroin playing on the turntable. In, in, across the, and it was across the whole country, apparently. But also... I also know that in Montreal, that was the real hub of prog music in North America. That was where bands like Genesis, Van de Graaff, Generator, Straubs, all broke out of was Montreal. Somehow Montreal had its ear on what was going on in, in, in that sort of music and that style of music. And it was played on the radio more than it was anywhere else. In 2017, you, uh, 17, sorry, you released the Fairman's Curse, uh, and the progressive community actually uh, responded very positively uh, to the quality of the record. Uh, have you been uh, quite aware of uh, the, uh, the renewed uh, interest uh, in, uh, in that record specifically? I think that record was very important for us. Uh, for two reasons. It was produced by a guy called Chris Tangaridis, who was better known as a heavy metal producer. In fact, on the walls of his studio, there was a record hanging up, a diamond disc for 10 times platinum for a band called The Tragically Hip, who you may have just about heard of. <laughs> But anyway, he, he was the producer of that album and, a, and Concrete Blonde as well he produced. And he produced all sorts of heavy metal acts, Judas Priest, uh, Black Sabbath. And he just happened to have a studio four miles away from where I moved to uh, 10, no, about 12 years ago. And I didn't even know there was a studio there. And one night I was walking out to the Indian restaurant down the road from my house. And there were two guys in there talking with North, of, I thought they were American, but it, they turned out they were Canadian. And when I'd finished my meal and they'd finished theirs, I went over to their table and said, excuse me, I hope you don't mind me asking, well, what are you doing in this small town deal where I live? I'm a musician. And they said, oh, yeah, we're, we're recording an album up the road from here with Chris Tangaridis. And it was, it was the two lead guys from the band Anvil. And... It, it was extraordinary that they were recording in the same town and the film Anvil, the movie, was made in the film in the town where I live. And so it turned out that Chris Tangaridis, who owned the studio, was the tape operator on Grave New World and our album Bursting at the Seams. He was about 18 years old at the time and that was one of his first jobs was to, tape, to be the tape operator who operated the tape machine. And as I walked to the door, I knocked on the door. He looked at me and said, oh, my God. He said, I can't believe it. Where have you come from? I said, well, I live three miles down the road. And he said, oh, come on in, come on in. And he made me some coffee and we sat and talked. And I said, I want to make a solo album. Will you produce it? And he said, of course I will. Well, it was totally out of character with what he does. But I made this solo album and we then... After that, we made um, several albums in that studio with him. We did uh, The Broken Hearted Bride. Uh, uh, what's it called? I've lost track now. The one with a tongue on, a dog with a tongue on the front. Dancing to the Devil's Beat. And we made all of those albums there. 
Uh, but he was a heavy metal producer, but he just loved and understood our music. And the trouble with what happened was, in when we made The Ferryman's Curse, the tragedy was that a month later he passed away and died. And I was in hospital at the time, so I couldn't go to the funeral. But the rest of the band went to the funeral. But it was a very, very sad occasion, and we missed him dearly. For the new album, uh, Settlement, uh, you kept uh, the same lineup as uh, the Fairman's Curse. But let's just say that the recording went uh, differently for obvious reasons. Uh, well, tell us about that process, that new process for the Straubs, please. Well, Uh, I, I haven't lived in my own house now for a year since the COVID-19 uh, COVID came into existence because I had a flood in my house and I haven't been able to move back because there was fungus everywhere in the cellar and if I'd opened the door of that cellar it would have gone around the house and would have caused so much damage. And because of all the lockdowns, I've been living in my friend's house about... 20 miles away and so when the when the lockdown came she said well look you can't live in your house you better come and live here and this is where I'm talking to you now and I said well fine uh, and I had a guitar a brand new guitar I'd bought it brought it in Slovakia and it's called a, a Dovina I've got it here I'll show you it's a, a beautiful looking thing it's Uh, it sounds magnificent. Uh, and I bought the guitar and I, I started to play a song. And I thought, uh, well, hang on, I, I, I got the song going. And I thought, maybe we'd better make a record. So I phoned up Blue Weaver, our old keyboard player, because we needed a producer. And he now lives in Germany. And I said, will you produce the record? He said, I'd love to produce the record. And so he's, he said, well, how are we going to do it? And I said, well, I haven't got any recording equipment. I said, I've, I've given all my recording equipment away. I never thought I would need it because I had a studio with, with a, one of the world's best producers to hand. It was like my own private studio. <laughs> uh, so I, I had a, one time I had a Yamaha Flying Fader 16-track machine. I couldn't operate the thing. But anyway, I said to Blue, what shall I record on? And he said, well, hmm, he said, have you got anything? I said, no, I haven't even got a microphone stand. So he said, I suggest you get a, a Zoom recorder. So I said, what's that? He said, it's a little handheld recorder. And I said, I've never heard of it. He said... It's a tiny thing. I'll show you, and I'll show you what he suggested that I bought, which was a little handheld recorder. And that was the re recorder that on which I did all my guitar parts, all my vocal parts, my banjo parts, my auto harp parts, all on that little tiny machine. It's, it's got, you put a microphone in the top, or I bought myself a little Neumann microphone, which is fantastic. You plug your guitars into the sockets there. And so I was using the microphone to play my guitar. I was DIing it on there. And then uh, I said, well, I've got to set the tempo of the song. So I did that with a click track. And then on this computer I'm talking to you on now, I, put, I set the tempo with the click track, put the headphones on and played the guitar part for it. And then... I then played that recording back to myself through the computer and then sang the vocals to it. But the trouble was that I didn't have, I couldn't put it on at the same time as I put the guitar on, on a different track. I couldn't, I've never worked that out how to do it. So what I did was to hold the headphones off when the click track started so that Blue Weaver could hear the click going. And then when I was due to start singing, I put the headphones on and start singing. So he knew where this track had started and he had to match up my voice to my guitar. So, <laughs> so, so I for take the, uh, the title track of the album is Settlement. So I came up with this tuning on the guitar, which is an open E tuning. All the strings are either E or B. 
When there's you go like With that guitar going like that. And then I come in and sing on top of that. It is. It's quite astonishing to 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 have the end result settlement and thinking about the the little details that you had to do with the uh, with Blue Weaver actually. Uh, with the project, well, the difficulty was the difficulty was that once Blue had put it together with me singing on top of it, there comes a time when every settlement is due. Compromise. Other point of view. But then once I once that went out to the band, they just heard that and they said, "Well, what do you want us to play now?" I said, "Drums, bass, <laughs> guitar," and they all started to play from the top. And everything is a terrible cacophony of noise because nobody knew what anybody else was playing. They sent their individual parts on just listening to what I'd played. So then I said, well, that doesn't work. So I had to write out all of the chords of the song, every chord, all numbered with the words on as well, with color charts as to where the guitar came in, where the keyboards come in. The guitar was in yellow, the keyboards were in, were in green. And then I emailed everybody and said, here's the chord chart. Now listen to my demo. And I want Dave Lambert, will you play a guitar solo between bars 59 and 75? Uh, can the keyboards come in for a solo at bar 123? <laughs> and that's how it was done. So... But do you know, I have not seen or spoken like we are speaking now on Zoom to any member of the band face to face for a year. I have not seen them. I, I email them, but I have not seen any one of them face to face for a whole year. Uh, talking, talking about the song settlement, uh, the, the opening track of the record, I do not remember a stronger rock song from the Straubs. Uh, tell us about that one, please, because uh, it is really coming on strong when you, with the opening of the record, and it's really, it's not heavy metal, uh, but it's strong, it's heavy. It's, you, you got the feel of it when you're listening to it. Uh, the, all of these songs that were written for this new album were written about what's been happening in the world around us. And when COVID and the lockdown came in, it was a very, very strange environment when you, were, you looked out of the window at the, at the front of the house and there were no cars going by, no buses, nothing. There was nobody walking out in the street. The only people you saw were at seven o'clock at night when the government encouraged us to go out and clap our hands for, the, for our National Health Service and all the workers in it for the good job they were doing. But at the same time, the government were making mistakes and you could see that there were mistakes being made. We didn't have any PPE or you know, protective equipment. They're all stored up. The government cutbacks that they'd put into place over the previous 10 years, there wasn't any stored up. So if we had nothing. And so it all was totally chaotic. And, but the government was putting out propaganda all the time and I became very angry about it because everything was saying, this, it, there was, I called it, they were, they were selling us heaven sent. Everything was, oh, everything's going to be fine. It's all going to be good. Don't worry, it'll all be over. But you could tell. And I thought, I, I branded it as being heaven sent with a capital H and a capital S as being heaven sent. And then I did another another brand which was crash and burn everything's going to be crash and burn and then i at the end the final bit was storm and drang and it's all chaos in the system and that's what the government were chucking out and i was very angry about it but there was a general mood of anger 
in the public over here about the way in which the whole COVID crisis has been handled and there is still an anger. On a more positive side than the situation which gave us uh, a beautiful record, that, by the way, uh, with the production of Blue Weaver and X Trobs, the part, uh, the uh, uh, a guest as John Ford, who also is an X Trobs, uh, you talked about Dave uh, Lambert and Chas Kronk, uh, which uh, are part of the Strobs for more than 40 years now. Tony Fernandez on the drums have been with you 10 years or so, if I'm not mistaken. Oh, he, Tony Fernandez goes back to 1978. It was his first oh, album. Okay, okay. so he, he went, he, he, went, uh, he went and came, by, uh, came back. Yeah, he, 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 he was with us before and he came back again. Okay. The Straw... Straub's is have, a big family. Yes, yeah, remember that, that was my Straub is it's a family, and you don't lead the family. You might fall out for a while. <laughs> you might you might argue, and you might have a bad day. But by and large, we all get on very well. There's moaning and groaning. Oh, <laughs> there's always somebody arguing. But by and large, we all get on well. But it, the new boy was Dave Bainbridge, who came on board when mm. we made The Ferryman's Curse. And Dave is an ex extraordinary keyboard player, but also, as you will find out over the coming months, he's an extraordinary guitar player as well. And there are very few keyboard players who can play lead guitar at the same time anywhere near as well as he can. And there are very few keyboard uh, guitar players who can play keyboards anywhere near as well as he can. He is a very, very talented musician and he's made a great difference. Uh, I talked about the rock side, but uh, uh, you talked about the origin of the Straubs uh, and the folk side is, of course, uh, of prime importance. Uh, does it, in the uh, songwriting process, does it come naturally to you or do you have uh, to be aware to... Uh, to put a little folk and then a little rock or just blend together naturally? It, I, I never think about what the songs uh, sound like. I hear the sound. I always write on acoustic guitar or the piano, sometimes on the dulcimer. And uh, the, the songs are organic. They happen when they happen. Uh, these songs were written very quickly. The song We Are Every One was written in half an hour after I'd watched the, the sad death of George Floyd in America when the guy was kneeling on his neck. And I was so horrified seeing that on the news on the television. I came up to this room I'm in now and picked up a guitar and sang it straight away. I just picked up and started strumming away. It was a... Yeah, it, 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 it's a very nice song, actually. That, that was a, an alternative verse that I came up for the first verse. That, was, that didn't appear on the record. So you've got something unique there. <laughs> And to think it took uh, just half an hour ta talking about talent. Uh, for, uh, for the last year, of course, uh, everyone who settled down, but uh, most of the bands and the artists have use the social medias for uh, to perform promote or communicate with their fans and i know the straps did the same and uh, can you give us a few examples of how you use those well we didn't do it like other people either making a video where you got blokes of our age walking along with young young women through <laughs> misty forests looking at the sun and the, and walking through the The, walking through the shallow waters of the sea. We didn't do that. Instead of which, I decided I wanted to show people that I'd got my dulcimer out again and I was using it. Now, with a dulcimer, I play it sitting on my lap. I haven't got it here at the moment, but it sits on my lap and I play it like that. 
But when I had to play it, you can't record with that machine there, push the button and then play it and it doesn't work. So what I had to do was to put it on an ironing board in the kitchen and put the dulcimer on the ironing board, put the laptop on the ironing board and then recorded the dulcimer while I was standing up playing it. And I put a little clip of that up on a YouTube and it had 4,000 views. And I thought, good Lord. <laughs> Obviously. And that, that, that is the instrument that is the bed, the bed and the sound of the bed of the song The Visit, the, the Dave Lambert song on it. And then I thought, well, that's good. So I'll, I'll do a little demonstration of how I came up with the guitar chords of Strange Times. I put that up and got a huge response on that. Then I said to Dave Lambert, hey, can you do a, a little piece about you, how you use the Ebo on the guitar? He put that up. I said to John Ford, can you do a little, little bit about your studio and how you, you live in New York and how you where you're living in New York and how you'd manage to put it together and send it off to Blue Weaver, who lives in Germany, by the way. This band is strewn. We're all around the world. And... And then in the end, I got uh, Scott Joubert in South Africa. He did a little piece showing how he played the bass on Judgment Day. And all of these pieces were, have been hugely, beautifully and well received. And in the end, Blue Weaver did one showing how he changed my guitar sound from being this guitar here and put the echoes on it and how he cleaned my squeaky finger marks up, my finger notes out of it. And that has built up such an interest in the album that the album is selling, but it was only released last Friday, and it appears to be selling very, very well indeed. There's been a huge pent-up demand for it because of all the, these little pieces, and people have said, wow, what is this going to sound like? And so far, the very the few reviews I've had and looking at Facebook and watching the people, our followers on Facebook, they absolutely love it, and they can't believe that we could made it with nobody meeting up at all face to face, with everybody being strewn around the world, in different parts of the world, not meeting up, with the, or everybody sending their parts to Blue Weaver in Germany, who compiled all the pieces together. Tony Fernandez, by the way, lives in Portugal. That doesn't help. <laughs> so, so we, we literally are. It, it was a worldwide. It was a global album, and it, it, it is, it, I'm not being daft, but it is a global album, and people love the fact that it was compiled like that, and there aren't many records that were coming out at the time, because people said, I can't get in the studio, what should I do? Well, we did it, but and everybody's got their own different recording setups. Blue's got a very sophisticated setup, as you would expect from a former BG. Uh, Dave Lambert's got a very simple setup. Um, much like mine. Uh, Chaz Cronk got his own home studio with a big, uh, uh, what do you call it, um, <laughs> Apple computer that drives it. Dave Bainbridge has got a sophisticated setup. Tony Fernandez, I had to buy him a blinking drum kit uh, uh, and send it over to Portugal for him because he, he only had his, he, only, he didn't have an electronic drum kit. So I, I got one over here sent it over there, and back came the parts on that. In the last week, I, I have listened a lot to Settlement, and I could not help myself but to think about one of my favorite Straub's record, Grave New World. Of course, there's a production of Blue Weaver, who was the keyboard player on Grave New World. Uh, but when I say that, does it make some kind of sense to you that I can compare those two records? Or I, am I, I just, or it's I just a personal impression? Well, they, both albums were designed from start to finish to tell a story, if you like. Um, they're not, it's, Grave New World was not a concept album, but it told the story of one young man's journey through life. And at the end, it's the journey's end. At the beginning, it's Benedictus, and the wanderer has far to go. That tells the story of the wanderer and where he goes. And so that album had a loose thread running through it. But that made it all the more important because it hung together as a as a piece. With this new album, I envisaged it first and foremost as a vinyl album. 
And to me, the vinyl record with 20 minutes aside is the perfect length of a record. A 40 minute album is the perfect length. When CDs came in, people said, hang on, you can get 60 minutes on a CD when the first ones came out. It's only got 40 minutes on it. I've been cheated. And so people started putting extra songs on. But those extra songs, there's so many, so many songs that you can do on a record that are all good. So what you're getting down to by the last few tracks, they're all, uh, they, the, the quality goes off. So I designed this album as the vinyl album. And the vinyl album starts with Settlement and it ends with the instrumental piece Chorale with a big organ at the end of it. But I then had three tracks left over and I didn't call them bonus tracks. I called them off the beaten tracks because I thought that was a neat little twist on the, you know, off the beaten tracks. Yes, it is. And it turned out that one of the songs, Champion Jack, has been well, so well received that people think it's a, a marvellous piece of prog rock. Uh, and then there was the song Better Days. That originally, that song was wrote, it was written in about a couple of hours, sitting out in the front garden in the sunshine in April last year. And then there was Chaz's song, uh, which finishes the album. But they're not, they're not weak songs, but they just didn't fit into the flow of the vinyl album as I heard it. So that's why I called them off the beaten tracks, and that's why they're on the CD and not on the vinyl. Because if we'd put them on the vinyl, the vinyl wouldn't have sounded as good as it does. If I can go back to uh, Aero and Aeroian, uh, it is one of the records who define prog rock in many ways. And at the same time, I would say is the more acclaimed uh, a record of the Strobs. Uh, some people might even know only that one, although I, I think there are another planet, but still. Uh, how do you feel about that record specifically and the, uh, the so important place uh, it take in the story of the Strobs? It, it came after we'd had huge success in the UK with part of the union and, and Grave New World and Bursting at the Seams. And then the band split in two. And we brought in John Hawkin on keyboards, Chas Cronk on bass, and Rod Coombs on drums. And the band had to start again, if you like. And people sort of almost thought, oh, wrote us off. But because we were taking off in America, the band was becoming more and more popular over there. Uh, we concentrated on playing in America and Canada over and over and over again. And because we put out Hero and Heroin as the first album with the new lineup, it somehow took off with the college audience and the beginning of FM radio. And especially in New York, FM radio was very important. And we took off in New York in a big way. And Straw started touring Believe it or not, our first tour of the USA was we were supporting Billy Preston, which was rather a curious combination. But by the time we got round to Hero and Heroin, we were going out as a joint package with King Crimson. And that was the most perfect fit ever in the history of, of music, as far as I was concerned. We both admired one another's music, and we had a wonderful time as friends equally as much as we did enjoying our, one another's music. And it made us, it made both bands go, go to far better heights than they'd ever done before because we would go on first and we were determined that we were not, we were going to get better and better and better and we did. And then Crimson had to follow us and it made, it, they had to up their game as well, which was so, it was, there was no animosity, but everybody, we all admired one another. But as I say, it, the college audience, took on to Hero and Heroin, in particular in Canada as well. And that was the album that really broke us. It spent 17 weeks, I believe, on the Billboard chart in the USA. And actually, it climbed, only went up to number 75, but it spent a long, long time on the charts. The album that followed it, Ghosts, went higher in the charts than any other album we had in America. And that really consolidated Straubs as being more of a prog band. And we really did begin to headline tours then on our own. <coughs> Sorry. 
But uh, we, the band really took off in those days, largely, as I say, due to the college audience, but also due to A&M Records, which was the best record company anybody could ever have been with, especially in Canada. Uh, it was a wonderful company to be with. There's, I was sad to hear of the death of Doug Chappelle uh, recently. That really upset me because he was such a wonderful guy and a wonderful supporter of the band. But then our management decided that we should leave A&M, which was the biggest and most stupid decision ever made. We made no madness. And then the records uh, began to, didn't sell in the same volume. They didn't get the same promotion, which was a shame because the records were good, but they just didn't get the same degree of promotion that A&M put into them. And, but nonetheless, we had uh, seven consecutive albums in the top 200 albums in the USA, which is a very good achievement for a band such as us. And there are very few bands that have had seven consecutive albums in the top 200 charts in Billboard. Uh, yes, the mega bands do, but not bands at our, uh, at our medium level, if you like. So we, we did very, very well. And I look back on it, and when we were in our, pre at a, in our peak in America, we were on the same level as Gentle Giant, Genesis, Straubs. Uh, we were all the same level. Crimson were a bit higher, and yes, went that little bit higher. But in terms of oh, bands in that era, in British bands in the prog era, those were the five bands that took off in the States and Canada. Uh, David, I've got, I've got a blink of an eye question for you, if I may. Uh, yeah. How come you studied maths and statistics at university, and, but ended up being a songwriter and a musician? Um, uh, it's, it's a very difficult story. When I went up to university, I was very much playing banjo and guitar, and I formed the first ever folk club and first ever jazz club at the university. And I was very, very interested in music. I took a few classical guitar lessons uh, when I was there. And when I came down from college, I started to play music uh, in, in various little tiny folk clubs. And I used to go for one, every Friday night, I used to go for a session in West London in a pub called uh, The London Apprentice, right on the River Thames. And it was a, a lot of musicians got together in a tiny room and swapped songs. And I learned so much from flamenco guitar players, from blues guitarists. I picked up, I was like a little sponge picking up everything that was going on. And then somebody asked us if we'd go and play and we became the Strawberry Hill Boys. And then I thought, well, I'll start my own folk club. Started that, that started to take off. And all the time I was doing it, I had a job in advertising. But then I thought, I, in fact, I, I was a, I designed the first ever advert to appear, colour advert to appear in the Pink Financial Times. I was responsible for that. I was, you know, I was very young, and but I, was, I was, had ideas. And so I started my own advertising agency and then began to work from home. And then the music began to take off. The straws became very popular. We were doing radio show after radio show, BBC shows, and we became more popular. But we couldn't get that breakthrough into making a record. And I went down to folk club one night and there was this young girl sitting on a stool wearing a white dress and a white straw hat playing a Gibson Hummingbird guitar. And it was Sandy Denny. And I heard her singing a Scottish song in the Gaelic language. And I went up to her afterwards and said, can I introduce myself? And she said, who are you? And I said, Dave Cousins. She said, I said, I enjoyed that. Uh, I'm, in a, I'm in a band. She said, what's the name of your band? I said, Straubs. She said, I said, do you want to join a band? Do you want to join us? She said, yeah, all right. And because we were very well known by then on the folk circuit. And so we rehearsed with Sandy. The first night we rehearsed, we started at seven o'clock at night and we were still singing at seven o'clock in the morning. These were all new songs that nobody had ever heard. I was starting to write really 
a very, very different types of material. All in these strange tunings, because I used, took the tunings off of the banjo and put them on guitar to see what they'd sound like. And that's how these straws have got that sort of strange modal sound all the way through the music that still lingers there now. We rehearsed with Sandy, made some demos. Nobody was interested in the record company in England. And a friend of mine who was married to a Danish girl said, I'm going to Copenhagen. I know the boss of a Sonic Records in Copenhagen. I'll take your tape with me. And Carl Knudsen of Sonic Records phoned me up from Copenhagen and said, I like your record very much. It's the best thing I've heard since the Beatles. I want to sign you. <coughs> Nobody else wanted us. So we went to Copenhagen to make our first album. And it sounded wonderful. They brought a drummer in for us and it just sounded magnificent. And with Sandy singing as well. But then I was given the job of finding a record label to put it out in England. It took me three months, but by then Sandy had been heard by Fairport Convention because she took back a copy of our record and played it to Joe Boyd, who was the manager of Fairport Convention. And he said, you're the one for Fairport Convention. So off she went. <coughs> but in the meantime, Carl Knudsen in Copenhagen played our record to the international director of A&M, who loved it took it back and played it to Herb Alpha and Jerry Moss in California. And out of the blue, we became Britain's first band signed to A&M Records in California directly. Britain, the first British signing they made. And they put the first record out in 1969. And I haven't looked back since. Well, David, thank you so much for more than, more than 50 years of beautiful and relevant music. Uh, may I ask you to, clu to close the interview like you close your shows, the usual kind of sentence that, that we, we came to, to know? Oh, that's what, what you mean? Play a song or something like that? I only have my memories to last me the remainder of my days. For time has now decided. We must go our individual ways. The warmth I feel inside can more than overcome my loss. Oh, this is me today. Tomorrow I must count the cost. We'll meet again sometime, though the road is steep and very hard to climb. That's how we finish our shows. Thank you so much.